Susan Bottom here this evening, who is a garden historian, and she comes with a long pedigree of gardening. And I have, um, in my early days in being in this area, I remember her at Cool Sturbridge Village, and what a wonderful resource she was helping people to learn about gardening, and she continues to do that. And now, in this lecture uh, style situation, it's even better for us because we have re recording and we can uh, refer back to it again. And it's all compliments, or excuse me, it's all thanks to the Cultural Council here in Southbridge who have uh, funded a grant for this program. And we're delighted that Christy is back again. Uh, you have your handout, and um, it's a really good way to get started. And um, let's get the program underway. So thank you very much, Christy. Thank you, Mark. And welcome back. Can we do the lights just a yes. little bit? You don't have to go too far. There, yeah, that's, that's good. That. Oh, that's great. Good. That's good. Okay. So we're going to be talking about the family nurse, home medical care in the early 19th century. It's so the period of Old Sturbridge Village, which focuses on the first part of the 19th century up to about 1840. And a lot of what I'm going to be talking about continues well into the 19th century. But that period of time is my focus and comes from my work at Sturbridge Village where we portray 19th century people in costume and we actually act out a lot of the history that happened at the time. And so here you see in the Fitch House at Old Sturbridge Village a family nurse dosing a patient. And we're going to be talking about home medical care. The title of my talk comes from a book called The Family Nurse, written by a woman named Lydia Maria Child. And Lydia Maria Child was quite an extraordinary woman, really. She wrote a number of different books. She wrote novels. She wrote advice books for housewives, The Frugal Housewife. She wrote an advice book for mothers, even though she never had any children of her own, uh, called The Mother's Book. She also was very active in the anti-slavery movement with her husband, and uh, so she was a, a woman worth knowing. And her book, The Family Nurse, was published in Boston in 1837. It's available in facsimile reprint, and I have it with a copy of it with several other books on the table. Oh, welcome. Come in and join us, Thank please. You. Give your hand up. Thanks. So I borrowed her title, The Family Nurse, and she um, opens her book with some advice. And her opening advice is never meddle with medicines. And this is a good advice, I think, today. A lot of the advice that was offered in the past is still good today. She says, never meddle with medicines unless some disorder of the system renders them really necessary. Remember the friendly warning in the epitaph on an old <laughs> gravestone. I was well, would be better. Took physic medicine, and here I am. <laughs> so when she wrote her book, she says it in the opening of the book that it contains the elements of nursing and is by no means meant to supersede the advice of a physician. It's simply a household friend, which the inexperienced may consult on common occasions, or sudden emergencies when medical advice is either unnecessary or cannot be obtained. And of course, medical advice was not always as easy to obtain in the age before telephones and smartphones and all the other kinds of communication that we have today. But it doesn't mean that there weren't any physicians around. There actually were lots of them. And we're going to be talking about some of the different kinds of physicians. Dr. Jesse Kittredge, whose portrait is um, shown here, was what a physician called an orthodox physician. The orthodox physicians were the gentlemen who were traditionally trained in medicine. But you did not have to go through all of that training to call yourself a doctor in the early 19th century. There was no licensing requirement for physicians at the time. And it might at first surprise you to know that most of the population preferred it that way, especially here in New England, um, because it gave them more options for medical care. Whereas if um, physicians all had to be licensed, uh, then some of the people people wanted to choose uh, would not be available to serve them. And in some respects, this should echo with some of the sentiments today about um, orthodox medicine. So she, but uh, Lydia Maria Child was in favor of consulting a physician, and in fact, when she put her book together, she consulted physicians to enable the editing of her book. 
And she cautions people. She does not, in her book, give home um, nurses, family nurses, advice about preparing their own medicine from medical plants that would be risky. So just like today, when people are caring for the sick at home in the early 19th century, what they're doing is they are caring for people with health conditions they feel they can control. A lot of people will look back at the past and they'll say, show you know, people giving medicines or making medicines at home, and our modern first response to that is often, oh, that must have been really risky or really dangerous. When I'm talking about this in the herb garden at Old Sturbridge Village, I like to gently remind modern people that we keep bottles of aspirin and Tylenol in our house and we dispense them. If that was used in an inappropriate dose, the patient would die. And so even today, we still dispense medicines comfortably that could be dangerous if they weren't used properly. When we treat our family members at home, we are usually treating what we know to be self-limiting kinds of illnesses. You know, I, I usually will ask my audience, think about the last time that you were sick, meaning think about the last time that you felt poorly enough that you weren't able to go about your regular routine. When that happened, how many of you went to the doctor? None of you. Oh, one. <laughs> one. 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 And so this is just to remind you that caring for simple self-limiting diseases that we feel comfortable to treat is a common experience. People did that in the past too. That we do not try, we cannot dispense dangerous, really dangerous medications without a prescription from a doctor. And people in the 19th century knew that that was not wise as well. So Peter Good, in his Family Flora and Materia Medica, when he talks about digitalis, the foxglove plant, he says, in the employment of digitalis as a medicine, its effects require to be carefully watched. The patient should not use any active exertion and should be visited at least daily by the medical attendant. So digitalis is a medication where the helpful dose is so close to the dose that could be fatal that people knew this was not something that the ordinary person would mess around with and um, treat at home. There were quite a few medicines then as now that people could purchase at a store. So the country storekeeper deals in various kinds of extracts and essences, uh, medicines that people can buy off the shelf, the same as we buy things off the shelf today in a drugstore. So, Common medicines, Mrs. Child mentions, she says every family ought to keep a chest of common medicines such as Ipecac, castor oil, magnesia, paragoric, etc. And especially such remedies as are useful in croup. Infant croup could be a really serious problem when you couldn't get a doctor right away. This precaution may be the means of saving life when a doctor or apothecary cannot be summoned immediately. So people did keep a certain stock of drugs on hand that they could purchase at the store, and many of these were plant-derived drugs. Castor oil. Uh, anybody have castor oil memories from your yep. own childhood? I do. You have to be a certain age, I think, to right. have that. Uh, but it was used in the past much in the way um, any of us might remember it. Uh, my grandmother was big on castor oil as a spring tonic, something that you gave kids in the springtime to cleanse the system gently and get you ready for the summer. And castor oil comes from the castor bean plant, which is a plant that is quite toxic. If the, but the castor oil, so you didn't make castor oil at home, you bought it at the store, made by an apothecary who could control the extracting of the oil from the castor bean plant without getting any of the poisonous ricin into the oil, so it would be safe when it was prepared. Castor oil is a source of ricin? Castor bean is the source of ricin, ricin. right, it is. Um, and the oil has to be extracted under very controlled temperatures, and when that's done, the oil is safe and doesn't have any ricin in it. And the extracting process is one that had been around for a long time. What does cathartic mean? What is cathartic? Cathartic is, a catharsis is a purge, a purge. And so rhubarb, 
is a plant, there are a couple different kinds of rhubarb. Many of us have probably been eating spring rhubarb already um, that we grow in our gardens. It's common garden rhubarb. The plant that you see in the picture here is what's called Chinese rhubarb. And that was not one that people grew in their gardens to make rhubarb sauces and pies out of. It, um, let me give you a, folks a handout here. But at the country store, you could buy powdered rhubarb root in a glass jar. And powdered rhubarb root was at once a tonic and a cathartic. And so it would stimulate the system. It would energize you. That's what a tonic would do. A cathartic is something that will purge and cleanse the system. And purging the system was one of the first go-to methods employed when somebody was sick. And it seems quite drastic, but it had a lot of logic behind it at a time when people did not know yet anything about the role of germs. They didn't know about the existence of germs and bacteria and the role those played in diseases. And so when someone was sick, there was a great focus on observing symptoms. And this had been true for hundreds of years. And what people observed, if you think about many common illnesses, what you will observe is that there is often some kind of change in bodily fluids when we are sick. Think of the common cold as an example, when your nose runs and you cough up phlegm. Think of some disorder of the digestive system which causes you to vomit or may cause diarrhea. Changes in urine, either a stoppage or an excessive flow are, is often a symptom associated with illness. With external illnesses, cuts, can become infected and then pus flows from them. Blood is another bodily fluid. And so for many, many years, the focus on health had been to a great extent focused on various different bodily fluids. And the logic of this really makes sense if you don't know anything about germs and bacteria. And that was that what's, the logic was that what is happening is that the fluids in your system, which were often called humors, traditionally, the fluids in your system must be out of balance in some way. And so what nature is trying to do is to restore a balance of fluids by evacuating some fluids from the system <coughs> to restore your health. Um, one example of this is when someone has a fever and they, the fever gets higher and higher and just before the fever breaks, the person breaks out in an extreme sweat and then the fever breaks and the fever drops. So the, the logic then suggested that the body evacuates that excess fluid and then the system gets back to normal. And so a great many medications were employed to evacuate fluids of some kind. And one of the first steps was to cleanse the system with a cathartic. And in fact, the castor oil we just talked about was sort of a preventative. Um, it was regarded as a tonic, but it was also a, clean, a gentle cleanser. And so you would give castor oil to people in the spring of the year when they had been in the wintertime of lax habit, not as <laughs> active. And this could, um, if you're of lax habit, this could cause problems with your system. And so you might need to have a purge. So rhubarb root was the same thing. And in fact, plain old garden rhubarb, which is at its best at this time of the year, in the spring, when you need to cleanse your system, plain old garden rhubarb is a mild laxative. If you eat a lot of rhubarb sauce or a lot of rhubarb pie in the spring, it's a mild, gentle laxative, not as powerful as the Chinese rhubarb root, but it will still do the trick. And another uh, plant that we often overindulge in at this season of the year is asparagus. Yeah. Now, if you are an asparagus <laughs> lover, you may have noticed the impact that it can have on your urine. Absolutely. <laughs> asparagus is a diuretic. And the logic was that asparagus appears in the spring, that's when it's at its best. The reason is that that's when you should use it to cleanse your system of bad humors and, and restore uh, your system going into the spring and the summer of the year. So there's a lot of logic associated with these choices. I never like to make people from the past look weird and stupid because someday I'm going to be a person of the past and I don't want someone to do it. 
Another plant that um, is very much in the news today and was in the news in the 1830s was the poppy, the opium poppy. And several different opiates were important medications. People didn't try and make their own, again, their own medicine out of opium poppies because that was something that required the skill of an apothecary. But at the store, you might purchase laudanum, which was a tincture of opium. Uh, a tincture, <laughs> as I'll explain a little bit more in a few minutes, is an extraction of the medical virtues, the useful parts of the plant, by putting the parts, the plant into an alcohol-based solution. And that would extract the, the virtues of the plant. So laudanum is a tincture, an extraction made with alcohol. Paragoric, again, one that you could buy off the shelf when my first child was young uh, to put onto the gums of teething children to relieve the discomfort. And paragoric, can, can you see okay right behind me? I'll probably move this Yeah, <laughs> I need to control this, but I don't want to be standing right in front of you. I don't need a seat, no. Uh, so paragoric was available in the 19th century, and it was a, um, a tincture, again, a pleasant elixir, known to be mild and not as powerful as some other opiates. Um, but um, op an abuse and a problem of abuse of opium, opioids, was something that was in the news in the 1830s, just like it still is today. So moving away from the purchased medicines to advice to home people, like Mrs. Child, there were other writers of advice books on uh, how to make your own medicines. And one who became a real celebrity in his day was Samuel Thompson, spelled without a P, T-H-O-M-S-O-N. Samuel Thompson was a New Englander, and he's really quite a character. And he wrote his book, The New Guide to Health, he opens his book, as he says in the title page, with a narrative of the life and medical discoveries of the author. This was a man with a huge ego. Um, he <laughs> claimed a lot of um, d medical discoveries, which had actually been quite well known for quite some time. But he had an enormous popular appeal. Um, Samuel Thompson rebelled against the orthodox physicians that we were talking about earlier. He said that um, he rebelled in a couple of ways. He was a vegetable physician. Again, he probably, if he were alive today, would be just as big a celebrity as he was in the, in, in the 1830s because he extolled the virtues of vegetable medicines. His argument was, um, and, and of course a lot of the uh, orthodox doctors, as we've just been saying, used medicines that were plant-based as well, but in addition to plant-based medicines, they used mineral-based medicines. So um, things like um, calomel, mercurous chloride, for example, was a common medication employed by the orthodox physician. And Thompson said we should not be using mineral medicines he said, if God had intended us to be cured with minerals, we would all be eating dirt. And he said, we do not eat dirt, we eat plants. And that should show us that plants should be the exclusive source of our medicines. And so he wrote up a whole vegetable system of medicine. And he also <laughs> argued against the orthodox physicians, saying that there is enough um, medicine in our own country to make medicines, to make them all the medicines that we need to cure us if people just simply knew how to do it. Mm -hmm. And he said the orthodox physicians keep all that information to themselves. And when they write out prescriptions, they write them out in Latin, in a language that the ordinary person cannot understand. So he said, and they charge you some money for this, he said he was going to write a book that people would be able to understand so they could make their own medicine. But he did step somewhat into the role of the orthodox physician because he patented his system of medicine and then he charged $25 to agents to be licensed by him to be able to use his patented system. But he became extremely popular and there were Thompsonian physicians all over the place. We, in Old Sturbridge Village, the uh, Freeman Farmhouse, which was a Sturbridge family farmhouse, we have family letters and correspondence <laughs> from that household, and they mention the Thompsonian physician who was caring for one of the members of the family, and there was a Thompsonian physician listed in Sturbridge at the time, uh, along with three other Orthodox physicians as well. So it became a system of medicine that was 
throughout New England and then spread as people from New England moved into New York State and Ohio. It spread out there. It also spread down into the South. And Samuel Thompson's medicine, he says, there can, this is his quote that I just mentioned, there cannot be the least doubt there is medicine enough grows in our own country to answer all the purposes necessary in curing every disease incident to the climate if the people had a knowledge of it. And so he, like many, believed that plants were put where they would be of most use. And so it would be up to you to learn about the plants that grow in your area because those are the ones that will be the most useful for you. And one of the plants, his number one plant, is a native plant that grows wild here in New England. It's Lobelia inflata. It's called inflata because the seed pods of the Lobelia plant, which you can see right here, look like little inflated balloons. Mm -hmm. And they also look very much in shape, to Thompson at least and many others, they look a lot like a stomach. And people believed that plants would give you signs, signatures, as to how they should be used. That might be where they are growing, that, like I mentioned with rhubarb and asparagus, the time of year that they are at their best, or it could be something about the appearance of the plant. And so this was a sort of a, a fail-safe way, uh, many people believe, to determine the use of a plant. And so this plant actually does, if it is prepared and given, it can be fatal, if it is given in a dose that is too extreme. Uh, but what it does is it causes severe vomiting. And so it's popular common names were emetic weed or puke weed. <laughs> and um, it was the first medicine that Thompson, Samuel Thompson, would prescribe to his patients. And it, it was really the vegetable medicine con uh, counterpart to the calomel that the uh, orthodox physician, the mercurous chloride, the orthodox physician was giving. And Thompson said, the human body is like a wood-burning stove. He said, when it does not function well, what you need to do is clean it, just as you would with your stove. And so we clean out the body by giving the emetic weed the, uh, and purging the, the system. Then he said, the next thing you do with your stove is you reignite the flame <laughs> and bring back the heat. And he says, with the body, we do the same thing. So his number two herb was cayenne pepper. And he was not the only one who prescribed um, cayenne pepper for a variety of different things. But these were his number one and number two plants. And then these are a couple pages from his book that show you that many of the plants that Thompson recommended were things that had already been in the medical uh, practice for, in many cases, a hundred years or more. Uh, and we'll talk about some of these in a little <laughs> bit more detail. But he, Thompson wanted you to think that he had invented his whole system, <laughs> when in fact he kind of restructured the traditional system, gave key roles to a few plants that hadn't had key roles before, but then sold that, that system to people at home, his new guide to health. And Thompson relied on a lot of native plants along with many European plants, like the ones that were just on that list. But where many other people uh, in New England learned not only from people like Samuel Thompson, but also from Native American healers. Native American healers played a very significant role in New England. Uh, the American Indians were highly respected for their knowledge of native plants. Uh, we have a number of accounts. We have an account for a man um, by the name of um, Daniel Merriam, who was a printer from Brookfield, Massachusetts, who was troubled with dyspepsia, indigestion, and he tried several different ways to cure his indigestion, including things like taking long journeys and many of the other kinds of remedies of the day. But finally, he went to an Indian doctress just outside of Springfield, Massachusetts, and he wrote about staying in her home and being treated by her remedies, and that this was the one thing that finally really cured him of his dyspepsia. And Native American healers um, obviously are going to bring to the play a great many Native American plants, and one of those is the common plant skunk cabbage. That I love this image of skunk cabbage from Peter Good's Materia Medica on the right, which shows the plant as you would have seen it uh, about a month and a half ago when it was first starting to emerge from its winter dormancy. And you just see that spathe 
and the emerging leaf that comes up. And uh, Mrs. Child in the family nurse talks about the use of the root of uh, the skunk cabbage plant, which she said has afforded great relief in asthma, chronic cough, and catarrh. And catarrh is the 19th century name for a common cold. Uh, the cold is catarrh. So now I wanted to hear from one of these sick people in the room. I've assigned roles to a couple of people <laughs> to be ill. And so um, if there is somebody, number seven, who's not um, feeling particularly well at the moment, um, what kind of a problem do you have? I am a farmer. Oh. Number seven? Seven. Yes. I am a farmer and have been cutting trees for firewood. I have developed an itchy rash. I think it may be the itch. Poison ivy. Ah, yes, the itch. The itch. We've all experienced the itch at one time or another. Poison ivy. So the interesting thing about poison ivy, when the English colonists first came to New England from Old England, they had never experienced poison ivy because it does not grow in England. And you can imagine the dismay of the set people who were settling in Plymouth, cutting down trees and encountering the itch. And so they understood that this might be a health problem unique to the new area, and that perhaps the remedy for this problem would be a native plant as well. And so by consulting uh, the Native Americans, they were told, as I will tell you with your problem, that um, a decoction of sweet fern made by taking the, um, the sticky burrs of the plant, which you can see in Peter Good's illustration here, are where we have the most concentrated virtues, the medical properties of this plant, and we can make a decoction of those. We can boil them in some water to get a strong solution. So we would take a decoction, particularly the burrs, and then from that decoction we would make a fomentation. What we would do is we would soak a cloth in that, uh, you would say compress, and then apply that to the poison ivy, and um, this um, will soon heal the rash. Now, another native plant also is useful as we get, it's just starting from seed, this one. The sweet fern plant is actually not a true fern, it's a shrub, and it grows in pastures and along the edges of roadsides. It's a, a, a woody subshrub, a small shrub, and the leaves look very much like fern fronds, which is why it's called that. It's called sweet fern because it's very aromatic and has a really pleasing aroma. And it is the plant that was made into this remedy. But there's another native plant as well that's just getting started right now, the jewelweed plant, which is in the impatience family. It's related to your patient Lucy's, which are not native to North America. It's called, they're called impatience because they are impatient to shed their seeds. If you're familiar with this plant, when you see it, it will develop these sort of bean-like seed pods that will get quite fat. When they reach their extreme fatness, if you just gently touch the tip of them, they will explode and send seeds everywhere. It's one of my grandchildren's favorite plants to, uh, to investigate. And this plant, in the summertime, the crushed, it's very succulent, very, um, <coughs> juicy, and the crushed up plant was applied to um, the itch uh, or made into an ointment. Um, also, the dock plant, which I have brought along with me. Um, yeah, most people do have this. This is, a, this is not a native plant. This is a European plant, dockweed, which um, you may have growing in your landscape and has a large root with a very yellow coloration to it. Is and it a burdock? Um, bur a burdock is a different dock. Yeah, that's okay. yeah it's yeah. a different dock. That we, there are two. Uh, this is the common dock or large leaf dock and there's also a dock called the curly dock where the edge of the leaf is very curly or rippled and both of them are used in the same way. Uh, one of the uses of this plant was to make ointments and it was the root of the plant that was used. <coughs> Now, leaves of plants and even the juicy leaves of the jewelweed will give up its virtues easily, gives up its medical properties easily. Roots do not give up their medical properties so easily, and so you would need to simmer this in water for a considerable period of time, or chop it up 
in some fat, like some lard or some butter, and simmer it in a skillet to release the virtues into the fat. Then when it was fully simmered, you would strain out the plant parts and save the fat, which now has the virtue in it, so it could be used as an ointment to help heal um, skin irritations. Ah, person with problem number six. I have influenza. influenza. I am an elderly woman. About a week ago, I became very feverish. My muscles and joints ached, and my chest is congested. I have a bad headache, too. Okay, so symptoms. Uh, very feverish, um, achy muscles and joints, congested chest, bad headache. We probably all had the influenza at one time or another. So what would you do for that? Well, one plant, one Native American plant that is often used, this would be to treat your fever. So oftentimes when um, you have a complicated series of symptoms for an illness, instead of just a simple symptom like the itchy rash, then it might take more than one plant, one to treat each of these symptoms. And to treat the um, fever, uh, the bone set plant was one, the eupatorium. Uh, it's called eupatorium perfoliatum. And what perfoliatum means is through the leaf. One of the ways to accurately identify this plant in the wild is to notice that the stem appears to grow right through the center of the leaf. That's an identifying characteristic of it. It blooms with these white flowers on it toward the end of summer. It usually grows in wet um, fields. Uh, and this is a Native American plant uh, that was used to treat fevers. It is a soporific. What it does is it induces sweating. So when a medicine is made out of this plant, uh, an infusion, by taking the leaves of the plant or the flowering part of the plant and soaking it in water and then making a medication from that, taking that, it will induce sweating. To, so it's designed to break a fever. And the plant has another close relative, Eupatorium purpureum, which is called Joe Pie Weed. And, um, Joe Pye is the name of this plant, is believed by many sources to go back to a Native American somewhere here in New England who was known for traveling about the countryside with medications made from the Eupatorium to treat typhus fever. And so the, his name was given to the weed. So we could treat you with that for your fever. And um, then to treat some of your other uh, conditions, we might want to use the sage plant, which will help your headache. Uh, an infusion of sage leaves, which you might drink as a tea, would be good for a headache. And uh, if you, um, uh, if we make a gargle of that, you have a sore throat and a cough and congestion to go with your symptoms. So by soaking the sage leaf, making a tea out of the sage, then adding some sugar to that or some honey to that uh, to make it into a syrup, and gargling it, or adding vinegar to it as a gargle as well, uh, could uh, help with the congestion of the throat. Now to make medications, I love this um, Cruikshank, George Cruikshank. I've got a couple of George Cruikshank cartoons in here, but this one is um, making a recipe for corns. Uh, her footwear is probably <laughs> contributing to her discomfort. Uh, but there are a couple of different ways that medicines are made, and I've mentioned a couple of these already. So to prepare remedies, as I said, what we want to do is we want to start with a plant that has medical virtues, properties that will address particular symptoms. And we have to get those properties out of the plant and into a form that we can then use to get the virtues to the part of the body that needs to be treated. So one way to do that is by making an infusion. An infusion is simply a tea. And it's probably the gentlest way to prepare a medicine from a plant. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, plant leaves and flower buds are delicate parts of the plant and they give up their virtues easily. So an infusion or a tea is often the method chosen. And we would just crush the plant parts, put them into a vessel, a teapot or a pot, bring water to a boil, and then just like making a cup of tea, we would pour the boiling water over the plant leaves and let it steep. The difference between your cup of tea and a medical tea or infusion is the amount of time it steeps. So you might steep a tea bag for three to five minutes, depending on how strong you like your tea, but you might steep 
herbs for a medication anywhere from 15 minutes to half an hour or so to get the strength that was desired. So that would be an infusion. A decoction, as I mentioned earlier, is a little bit stronger. So if we're going to use woody parts of the plant, like the sweet fern we talked about, or like a root, like the dock plant, which will not give up its virtues so easily, then we're going to put them into the kettle and actually boil them in the water. It's a little more aggressive way to extract the virtues. Then that um, water can be strained, and then we can use that water in a variety of different ways as, um, as a drink to give to somebody, or it can also be used to soak a cloth in to um, make a, a fomentation. And tinctures, as I mentioned, some plants don't give their virtues up into water easily. Uh, and so an alcohol, usually something like a brandy or a rum, might be used to, instead of water, to make, to draw out the virtues of the herb. Then the advantage of a tincture, when it is done, is that because it's in an alcohol base, you can keep it. A tea or an infusion would need to be made fresh again the next time you used it. You couldn't keep it around very long, but a tincture uh, could be bottled and then put on a shelf <coughs> and kept for a long time to be used. And then salves and ointments, when we need those to treat these external um, conditions, and we would make them by cooking the plant part, the useful part of the plant, in a fat or an oil. Uh, sweet oil, which would be purchased at the store, was what the 19th century called olive oil. So it was olive oil, and you could buy sweet oil at the store. So if you wanted to make an ointment, you could heat the sweet oil and heat the herb in that until you had infused it and then strain it out. And salves are usually made with some common fat. Lard is the most common. This is fat from hogs, and it's one that people would have in their house for a wide variety of cooking, for making soaps, uh, all kinds of uses, and so you would have that on hand. The advantage then is that you would have, once you had made that with the herb, again, when you strain the herb parts out of the heated fat, and just let it sit, it would um, solidify again, get firm again, mm -hmm. and you could keep that on hand to use it as a medication. It would last for a long time. I'll be talking about a, several medicines that use these methods. And then poultices. Poultices are used externally, and they are a way to take the virtues of the herb that have been taken out in a decoction or in an infusion and then to put them into a form that you can apply, say, to an aching joint or to um, a wound that might be at risk of mortification, of getting in severely infected. And poultices involve taking some kind of a medium that would absorb that liquid, and cornmeal or bread are two that are often used, soaking those with the infusion, of, with the virtues of the herbs, then putting that onto the site and binding it on with a cloth. And you could heat that up, too, so the warmth would also add to the usefulness and the effect. So here are just a few poultice recipes from Mrs. Child's family nurse. So you can see the wide variety of different kinds of poultices that she uses. Uh, a rotten apple is an interesting one. Uh, a rotten apple, it was, uh, some people, you may know people who put cucumber slices on their sore eyes or tired eyes. A rotten apple was used in the same way for um, sore eyes. Uh, or if you didn't have rotten ones around, you could just take a whole one and then roast it to soften it up and use it in that way. Uh, one of the more interesting poultices is down at the bottom, uh, horse manure simmered in urine and applied warm every 15 or 20 minutes is a very powerful and efficacious, useful, uh, even in advanced stages of mortification, that severe infection and breakdown of the tissues, and the natural color of the flesh will gradually return and the mortified portions separate. So in order to prepare all these medicines, you might be gathering herbs from the wild, as we've mentioned a lot of the native plants, but it was also important to grow some of the most useful plants that you wanted in your own garden. As Mrs. Child in her American Frugal Housewife offers this advice, those who have a little patch of ground will do well to raise the most important herbs, and those who have not will do well to get them in quantities from some friend in the country 
for apothecaries make very great profit upon them. So it's nothing new, uh, the cost of medications. And the image that you see here is Sarah Anna Emery's um, illustration of her household in Newburyport, Massachusetts, showing their kitchen garden. And she listed a number of things that were grown there, but she mentioned a supply of medicinal and sweet herbs that were always on hand in her garden. And here's a garden plan from Thomas Bridgman's American Gardener's Assistant. And you can see a variety of different common <coughs> vegetables growing in this kitchen garden plan. And right down here at the bottom, a bed devoted to herbs. And that would include not only cooking herbs, but also the favorite relied upon herbs that people might use for their home remedies. Seed catalogs were a source of seed for <coughs> such things. Here's the title page from the 1836 New England Farmer Seed Stores catalog in Boston, Massachusetts. And there is a page of medicinal herb seeds. And you might um, be interested to note some of the um, various kinds of things that are listed in here. Um, seeds that people could buy to grow various kinds of herbs. Some of them are the ones that the apothecary might buy, like the official poppy, for example, or the purple foxglove. But you may also notice on here some plants that you thought were only used in cooking, and they are here listed as medicinal. Coriander, for example, um, dill, things, fennel, and things like that. And we'll be talking about some of those. <coughs> Samuel Goodrich in 1857 had wrote a wonderful book, Recollections of His Lifetime, and he described a garden. He said, to the left was the garden, which in the productive season was a wilderness of onions, squashes, cucumbers, beets, parsnips, and currants, with the never-failing tansy for bitters, horseradish for seasoning, and fennel for keeping old women awake in church time. <laughs> One of fennel's values was that it was a stimulant, so you might carry fennel leaf or fennel seeds with you to the two-hour uh, service at the meeting house if you were afraid of insulting the minister by falling asleep in the middle of his hour-long sermon. So preparing medicines from home-grown plants, um, advice from Mrs. Child about preparing them, Annual plants, plants that grow from seed to producing seed and die in just one growing season. Of these plants, it is usually the leaves, stems, and blossoms that are used for medicinal purposes. And Mrs. Child uh, advises that they should be gathered in blossom, dried thoroughly, and kept in paper bags well preserved from the air. Now, there's a lot of advice about drying and preserving <coughs> herbs in the 19th century, and not everyone agrees. Uh, there are some who would argue, as many people today would, that especially if it is the leaves of the plant that you wish, that you should harvest those just before blossoming, before the plant puts a lot of its um, essential oils into the flowers, and that they should be stored in glass containers, in tight containers, rather than in paper. But we find when we look at 19th century sources that there's a wide range of difference about how things should be dried, some hanging them in attics for long periods of time and even just leaving them hanging there until they were wanted. Uh, others being um, very careful to, as one writer said, kill them quick, uh, heating them in front of a fire to dry them really quickly to make sure you don't lose any of the essential oils and then storing them in tight containers. When it came to perennial plants, it is often the roots that are used. When a plant goes dormant in the fall, it stores its essences down in its root system. And so the advice is that the plant should be, the roots should be dug quite late in autumn or very early in the spring before the <laughs> essence of the plant had gone up into top growth and while the root was still really um, very strong in its um, medical properties. And that they should be uh, dried and then kept carefully covered in bottles or jars. And here you see a young woman who is getting ready to prepare some herbs. She has the dried leaves and she's pounding them with the mortar and pestle to break them up so that she can then prepare them by, um, by breaking them up fine, they will release more of their essences into an infusion when you make a medicine or use them cooking too. And in fact, anybody who had common cooking skills in the 19th century would know how to make the medicines that I've described to you because 
basically boiling water, frying, and steeping are the common methods used to make something into a medicine. And by the time you were a young woman, of, uh, a girl of 10 or 12 years old, you would have the cooking skills required to make most common herbal remedies. This is a, a frontispiece from a book published in Worcester in 1845. Uh, <coughs> Esther Howland, whose uh, father was a publisher, a printer in Worcester, wrote The New England Economical Housekeeper. And uh, the Economical Housekeeper, like a lot of other cookbooks and uh, advice books, goes beyond just cooking and often includes remedies. And so uh, she gives a remedy for dropsy. Um, dropsy was the common name at the time for any uh, unnatural accumulation of fluids. So that could be in the whole body, a swelling and accumulation of fluids, or it could be just in one part of the body. And Mrs. Howland recommend, or Miss Howland recommends the common dandelion uh, as a, um, a remedy for this. And she offers a lot of different ways that you could use it. You could eat a salad with the usual dressing, vinegar, or the juice of the dandelion could be taken in a dose of half a wine glass full three times a day. Or you could just simply carry the leaves of the plant around in your pocket and nibble on them frequently during the course of the day. So the common dandelion really came here from Europe. We think of it, it's so common that we think of it as a native plant, but it isn't. It was brought here because it had many, many uses, including as a medicine. In addition to treating dropsy, uh, one of the things that the dandelion did to treat accumulations of fluids is that it's a diuretic. It will stimulate the flow of urine. And people believed that the yellow flower was a sign that that was how the plant should be used. Mm -hmm. Plants that had yellow coloration were often employed for um, remedies that involved the urine. And one of the common kind of homely names for the dandelion was pisabed, so <laughs> capture that's used. But um, the Family Nurse and many other books also talk about the prevention of disease. So um, Mrs. Child says many diseases could be prevented by the habitual use of such diet as promotes a healthy state of the digestive organs. Sound familiar? You still get this advice today. Eat well and then you won't have to get sick. And some of the things that we think of as common foods are things that also had medical virtues, medical properties. Now the tomato um, in the 1830s was not anywhere near so well known as it is today for a wide variety of reasons. One is that it had not been part of the traditional English foodways diet. The tomato is native, as you may know, to Central and South America and didn't arrive in England until quite late. It arrived earlier with the Spaniards and the Italians in Southern Europe, where it also grew more readily and easily because the climate is warmer there. One of the problems with the tomato in New England is we have to grow it in a warm, brightly lit place for six to eight weeks before it's safe to put it out into the garden. Many of us have tomatoes waiting in our house even now for the nighttime temperatures to get warm enough for them to go outside. And we have the advantage of um, eat of a house that is warm night and day, and so we can put them near a sunny window, or we can use electric lights, um, grow lights to grow them under. So the difficulty of growing them, the lack of familiarity, and some for some period of time, because the plant belongs to the nightshade family, which includes a large number of very toxic plants, mm -hmm. and in fact, the foliage of this plant would make you really sick if you ate a lot of it, so if somebody if you first saw the tomato and somebody explained it to you by saying, now don't eat the leaves of this plant, because you could get really sick, but you can eat this red thing. <laughs> you might be a little bit dubious. But by the 1830s, there was an interesting movement afoot with a couple of people, one by the name of Miles from out in Ohio, his name still survives in the Miles Laboratories, the family name, and another gentleman from Connecticut, I'm not gonna, but, uh, Phelps from Connecticut, they got into a battle over who should be able to patent extract of tomato. And it was claimed that extract of tomato could cure everything from baldness to the bilious colic. And so people began to hear about it now as something for your health. And people began to reevaluate it. And Thomas Bridgman in 18, about 1850, his young gardener's assistant, he writes about the value of the tomato and he gives it quite a send off here. 
a celebrated writer observes that the common tomato made into a gravy by stewing it over the fire and used as a sauce for meat has been known to quicken the action of the liver and the bowels better than any medicine he ever made use of. And when inf afflicted with inaction of the bowels, headache, a bad taste of the mouth, straightness, tightness of the chest, and a dull, painful heaviness of the region of the liver, the whole of these symptoms are removed by the tomato sauce. And the mind, in the course of some few hours, is put in perfect tune. And so the virtues of the tomato become extolled as a medication. Now what we have to try and do with foods, of course, is we have to eat them wisely. We want to prevent diseases like the colic, which um, you see here in Cruikshank's cartoon. I think we all probably know how this woman feels. That's a symptoms we've all experienced. So per sick person number four. That would be me. I love to eat cabbage, beans, cucumbers, and beef. However, I am often, often troubled with dyspepsia, and especially the windy colic. Ah, the windy colic. Did you hear her diet? Beans, cabbage, cucumbers, and meat. And she may suffer from, it's very kind of you to be so honest about this, <laughs> from the windy colic. And so we need remedies to, the best thing to do is to prevent the windy colic. And so there are a number of things we can do by adding appropriate herbs to our food when we eat them to prevent the digestive upsets that those foods may cause. And it's interesting that we still pair some of these herbs with the same foods, but we don't realize that that pairing was not just for flavor in the beginning, it was also to prevent digestive upsets. So if you put dill with your cucumbers, cucumbers can tend to cause gas with some people. Dill will prevent that. So by putting dill on your cucumbers, you prevent that. Fennel also is a stimulant. It is useful in dyspepsia, colic in children, digestive complaints. So when fennel is put into foods or served as a candied seed at the end of the dinner when some of those foods might have been served, then it can help to prevent the digestive upsets. Think of the plate of mints that gets passed to you in the restaurant with your check. They don't want you to feel nauseous after eating a restaurant meal, so they give you mints at the end of the meal with your check. Savory, there are two types of savory. This is summer savory, an annual form that grows from a seed and then goes to seed and dies at the end of the summer season. It's close relative. Winter savory is a hardy perennial here in New England. The summer savory is a little milder flavor. The winter savory a little more pungent. Um, they're savory herbs, they're good with meat dishes, um, but they are especially good with beans. In fact, when German visitors see this plant growing in the herb garden at Old Sturbridge Village, they will say, ah, der Bohnenpflanz, the bean plant, uh, because it was paired with beans to prevent the windy colic. Uh, I should also mention caraway seeds in the same breath. Uh, caraway seeds were matched up with cabbage. Uh, we still have many recipes for coleslaw or um, uh, preserved cabbage, what do I want to say? Uh, sauerkraut. Sauerkraut uh, that call for caraway yeah. seeds. And we may think it's just because the two flavors are so compatible. They are. But caraway is also a digestive aid, as are coriander seeds. Um, I brought some little coriander seeds, I'll pass these around, you can take coriander seeds. Those were candied by confectioners in the 19th century and sold as what were called comfits. I may have a slide on that coming up. Hops, and I have some hops, strobiles, harvested as well, we can take a look at those, um, which we think of certainly in the flavorings of beers uh, very popular plant these days, um, home brewers. The little cone-like strobiles contain a powder which is um, a yeast preservative, which was why it was first introduced into brewing. It flavors the beers, which is why it has stayed in brewing as long as it has. But it also was used to make healthful beers. 
So uh, this one was recommended by Jacob Bigelow, writing in Boston, and he writes about New England. He says, the hop has been found a decided and useful tonic, so it's stimulating to the system. A fermented decoction known by the name of hop beer. This is a very simple beer, usually formed with hops in the simple addition of treacle, think molasses, um, is much used in the New England states when made sufficiently bitter with the hops and taken as a common drink at meals, it promotes the digestion more than any of the table liquors of common use. So one of the reasons for drinking beer at a meal was that it would promote your digestion, make you less likely to suffer indigestion later on. And there were many herbs that were used in this way. And they were often served at the table here, you will see a cruet set in the center of the table and sauce boats, sauce boats, um, yeah. on the table as well. Sauces and the cruet set was not just salt and pepper, which we think of on the table, but it oftentimes would include things like um, mustards, would include cayenne, might include a horseradish sauce, all at the center of the table, to be put on to foods, not only to flavor them, but to make them more digestible. Mustard is one of the best stimulants employed to give energy to the digestive organs. Mustard will actually stimulate the flow of saliva. And so if we, anybody else want to see the coriander seeds? Have you seen those? Okay. Uh, when we put mustard onto meats, which was the preferred um, thing to use mustard for, what you're doing is you're stimulating the flow of saliva and making it easier for the body to digest meat, which was one of the hardest things for the body to digest. I was curious, is it the same reason that they did it, do it also because they really couldn't preserve the food? So um, they, they very well might have been contaminated in one way or another? Some of the herbs that are used in foods are used as, herb, as food preservatives. And a classic example of that is sage. Yeah. Um, sage was put into stuffings and sausages to foods that are very vulnerable to spoilage. And people had observed without really knowing what was happening that foods with sage tended to last longer without spoiling than foods without sage. Only after bacteria were discovered and their role identified in the spoilage of foods did people discover by examining the chemical properties of sage that it contains antibacterial components. And that also explains its use, as we mentioned before, as a gargle for the sore throat. Uh, that it actually was useful because also it's antibacterial. Native American healing. Right. Mustard quickens the appetite, warms the stomach, assists in digesting hard meats. So this is its principal role at the table. And it's not the only one. Horseradish as well will stimulate the flow of digestive juices. I can't even talk about horseradish without getting saliva for <laughs> just thinking about it does that. Uh, and so it was often used on meats for the same purpose. And then cayenne pepper. William Kitchener was a British writer, and his cookbook, The Cook's Oracle, was reprinted in Boston in the early 1820s. And he was responsible, really, for bringing a number of European plants and herbs into, like basil, into more common use here in uh, in this country, and he kind of extended, um, made the, the whole diet much more cosmopolitan here. And he recommended cayenne pepper. He said with all kinds of vegetables, as also with soup and fish, either black or cayenne pepper may be taken freely. And they are the most useful stimulants for old stomachs. So we're looking for a way to stimulate the stomach to make digestion go better. And in fact, capsaicin, which is one of the most active ingredients in cayenne pepper still plays an important role in a large number of different medical products. And I mentioned the coriander seeds. The seeds of the plant are a great carminative. A carminative prevents flatulence. And so coriander seeds have a pleasant flavor. When encrusted with sugar, are sold by confectioners under the name of coriander comfits. So little sugared seeds you could buy at the store from the confectioner and you put them on the table at the end of a meal. You can still get these in many um, Asian restaurants. Coriander seeds are often passed at the end of a meal um, as a digestive aid. 
and we think of them like the mints as sort of a little treat at the end of the meal, but they actually had a role to play. And then mints and balms and other teas, simple infusions uh, made by putting either the fresh or dried plants into boiling water in a covered vessel, which should be placed near the fire for an hour, so steeped for a long period of time. And these were used to treat, um, and I brought a, I have a peppermint plant on the table over here, a plant you know, we're probably fairly familiar with. Peppermint was, is the stronger of the two, peppermint and spearmint. Spearmint was used for mild um, uh, flavorings and, and mild medications for a stronger infusion or a um, more uh, rigorous kind of medicine. Peppermint was used. And Sarah Josepha Hale recommends this. And the family nurse mentions that it was in more general use than the other mints for wind, spasmodic pains, nausea, and likewise to cover the taste of disagreeable medicines and diminish their griping effects. We still, of course, get medicines that are flavored to make them less disagreeable and diminishing their griping effects. Some medications that tended to be um, cathartics to cause a purge to make you vomit could go a little bit too far in that direction. And so adding peppermint to them would help to mitigate that, make it less um, violent. The fresh herb bruised and applied to the pit of the stomach often allays sickness and is especially useful in the cholera of children. People believe that if there was a problem inside, like the cholera, the pain and, and cramping in the stomach, that if you gave somebody a tea to drink and then also made a um, compress, a fomentation of that same herb and put it on the outside of the stomach, then you'd be treating both from the inside and the outside at the same time. And they believe this was a good, a more powerful way to apply it. So, sick person number two. Ah, what is your problem? Ah. I am a school teacher teaching the winter term. Last week, some of my scholars stuffed the chimney with rags while I was having my dinner. The schoolhouse was filled with smoke, and I had to extinguish the stove fire. I took a severe chill, compounded by soaking my feet on the way home. Now I have a cold. Ah. Yes, this um, prank of stuffing the chimney in the schoolhouse while everyone was away having their dinner was apparently a fairly common prank. So you have a cold. Ah, so let's see, what should we do about that? Well, there are several useful plants you could employ. First of all, if the cold is accompanied by a cough, then whorehound would be a good plant. It's um, particularly recommended for coughs and diseases of the lungs. And we can make it into a syrup uh, by uh, making first an infusion, a tea, then taking that liquid and adding some sugar to it so that it will coat the throat. Or we can make it into lozenges by adding enough sugar so that it will candy. And then we would have a cough drop, a cough lozenge. Uh, hyssop uh, is another herb that is excellent for um, treating colds and all the symptoms of colds and coughs. And one good way to use it um, is to take the hyssop plant and then to add to it other herbs. If you're just using a single herb like whorehound, that's a simple. But when you have a serious cold and you have multiple symptoms, sometimes what you want to do is use multiple herbs to treat the same symptom. Un um, understanding that the strength of one may complement the other. So recommended here, in addition to the hyssop, is that you add to it elecampane. Elecampane is the, we use the root of the plant. This is a perennial, so you would want to dig elecampane roots. This is what it looks like when it's in flower. It gets about six or seven feet tall. And we would dig the root in the fall and dry that to keep it on hand so that we could make a remedy from it when it was needed for a cold. And so we could steep the um, hyssop, the elecampane, and the whorehound together and maybe put some flaxseed into that to make it thickened. Uh, so that it would um, adhere to the system better, and then take that one going to bed. Uh, and that's much praised as a cure for colds. The other thing that you're going to want to do is keep your feet warm. Mm -hmm. And so it's often recommended that you heat perhaps a brick and wrap it and put it at your feet uh, when you go to bed at night to um, make sure that you don't get too cold, don't get chilled at night. 
and and uh, also uh, raspberry leaf tea is a very good, especially if you develop a sore throat, that will help with that. So all well, the various things you could do to help treat your cold. So this is um, wild ginger, and it's one of the plants that is listed here, um, steeped in milk to promote perspiration, recommended for diseases of the lungs. And it's thought that the spicy root might be a substitute for ginger, for the traditional oriental ginger. And I brought, this is the time of year when the wild ginger plant is in flower. Um, the flowers are not anything that will win a prize because they lie right down on the ground and you have to get down on your hands and knees and look at the base of the plant in order to actually see them. I've wrapped this up, but I'll unwrap it because I want to pass it around so you can sniff the root and see the flowers of the wild ginger plant. Um, as its name, wild, suggests, this is a native New England plant, grows wild in the woods, and this is what looks like at this time of the year with these little flowers that sit right down on the ground at the base of the plant. The flowers are pollinated by flies um, and come down and crawl on the ground. And the root of the plant, if we scrape it to um, open it up a bit, I'll scrape a couple of these and then pass them around so you can sniff the root of it. And it has a remarkable resemblance to Thank you. the um, true Asian ginger. And so it was used um, in, uh, in flavoring, but it was also considered to have some of the same medical properties that the true ginger has to relieve nausea and calm the stomach. A lot of people today will, if they're troubled with, um, you know, uh, sick, getting sick on a plane or in a car, carry candy ginger root to chew to prevent that from happening. So it's still something that's in use. Are they actually related? They're not related plants, no. Um, it's interesting that there are various plant aromas. Lemon is one, licorice is another, and the ginger is another that seem to show up in a variety of different plants that are not related to one another. Um, botanists aren't sure, I don't believe, about this, but many of them think that it may, that the evolution favors these aromas because they repel insects, so they're kind of a natural insecticide, and plants that have them, you know, it, it will evolve with those because they are helpful, positive. So the headache, again, a, a wonderful um, cartoon here to illustrate how one feels when one has a bad headache. And sage, um, which we've mentioned already, one of the, everybody had a chance to sniff that? Okay. Um, so I think when people ask me at the village what do I think was the most common herb, I don't know because nobody ever took a poll, so I can only guess. But based on the common um, mention and the multiple uses, I would put sage right up there high on the list of common herbs in the 19th century kitchen garden. And one of the um, uses is this an infusion to, for the headache. And I mentioned already it's used for sore throats because of its antibacterial properties mixed with honey and vinegar as a gargle for sore throats. You can just set those on the table and I'll get them after. Motherwort, and I brought a motherwort spray with me. When I pass this one around, observe the decided dramatic square stem of the motherwort plant. Square stems are a botanical um, marker of a plant that belongs to the mint family. Now, motherwort doesn't smell minty at all. Not everything in the mint family does. Sage is in the mint family, and so is thyme and oregano. A, lot, a large number of herbs are in the mint family. Um, motherwort really shows that square stem pretty dramatically. Um, motherwort um, is used to induce sleep, to calm the nerves. It, um, it's Latin name cardiaca refers to its perceived impact on the heart to calm the heart. In fact, some herbalists believe more studies should be done of this plant to determine whether it really would have a honest to goodness role in modern medicine in this regard. It's called motherwort because it was an herb that was used 
a great deal by women. It was used by men as well. Um, it was supposed to, um, Mrs. Child says, it is good to make a tea for students who are troubled with wakefulness, <laughs> whether that's because you were worried about an exam or what. But um, it could be used across the board. But it also is um, a mild, um, it causes mild contractions of the uterus. It's not an abortifacient. But it was <coughs> given in a tea to women right after childbirth to help expel the afterbirth. Um, and it will calm the symptoms of a condition of women approaching 50 years of age, <laughs> regulators of a condition which was um, like um, menstrual problems, was sometimes put under the larger umbrella of hysteria. Now that amuses us to think of women having hysteria, but today we think of hysteria as just being sort of wacky out of your mind. But the root of that word, hysteria, is the same root as the word hysterectomy. It is the womb. And so in the beginning, the kind of mental disturbances of hysteria were the kind of mood swings and depression swings that women could experience. And so mother wart, W-O-R-T is an old Anglo-Saxon word that means herb or useful plant. So this was the herb that was useful for mothers. And this is a plant that I, I'm always amused by. It. It's not native here. It was brought from Europe. But it, it, and it, it doesn't seem to just wildly escape from uh, human habitation and go wild, like some European plants have done. It always stays close to the house. So if you own an old property, a property that has been had a house on it for a long time, look around for this plant. Notice what it looks like. Because it's often just lurking at the edges somewhere on an old property, as if it's just hanging around from those many women who used it in the past, waiting for somebody to <coughs> rediscover its usefulness. Every old I've lived in two old houses now, and every one of them has both of them has had motherwort growing just around the fringes of the property. Does it get that big? It does get big, yeah. Yeah, the plant, if it's growing in where it's happy, in good soil, it will get three feet tall, no trouble at all. It's a perennial. It's an herbaceous perennial. So the, like mints, the whole plant will die down to the ground in the fall, but the roots and the crown will stay alive through the winter, and new shoots will come up the next year. It makes very small, it has tiny little flowers, no showy flowers at all, and they're followed by kind of prickery kinds of little seeds on the stems, and it will self-sow and spread quite easily. It takes care of itself pretty well, uh, but it can get really large if it has good growing conditions, and especially if it's a couple years old. Now, remedies for children. Um, of course, we all know children and medicine can be difficult, and Mrs. Child offers some suggestions, particularly with castor oil, which um, really tastes terrible. And she says, when children have an insuperable objection to taking it, it may be effectually disguised in the following manner. Boil it with an equal quantity of new milk, sweeten it with sugar, and when cold, give it to them for a drink. They will often love the taste of it. Any of us who've ever had it might find that hard to believe. <laughs> so making, oops. Ah, number three. number three. I'm a young mother. My three-year-old child is often attacked with symptoms of fever, most frequently at night. His skin is dry, his pulse rapid, the flesh hot and breathing quick. My physician does not live nearby and I have no experienced nurse to assist me. What can I do? Well, I would recommend that you would want to be sure and have on hand these plants, which are excellent for treating illnesses of children. They are very safe. You don't need to worry that you might, because you are young and inexperienced, might do something risky with these. Catnip or catmint and German chamomile are both herbs that will do a variety of things to help a sick child. They can reduce a fever, calm the stomach, and help the child sleep to regain sleep. So these are plants that were very common in households with people who had young children because they were kind of the go-to all-purpose plant. For fevers with children, you might want a plant that would be pleasant for them to take. Uh, and I have brought with me uh, some lemon balm. Lemon balm is also in the mint family. Uh, you can 
squish the leaves and smell the lemon balm. Lemon balm and borage are two plants that were commonly grown to treat fevers, to make an infusion or a tea that could be sweetened and then given as a remedy for fever. The lemon balm, as its name suggests, t is very lemony tasting. Borage has a cucumber-like flavor. And just as today we will sometimes say cool as a cucumber, people believe that that cucumber quality would be cooling and thus would be a good remedy in the case of a fever. Oops, I'm running late. Uh, am I okay? Uh, we, we need to wrap up. Okay. So lemon balm is a cooling drink in fevers and it aids medicines that might be given for perspiration. So if you're giving something like bone set to help perspire, the lemon balm can be added to that. A child's fever can also be broken up by using an onion. And onions were used for what were called drafts, and that's D-R-A-U-G-H-T, like a draft animal. And a draft animal is an animal that draws, that pulls. So a medical draft is one that pulls. If a child has a fever, or even if an adult has a headache, then we would assume the humors in the body have all gone up and concentrated in the head. And what we want is we want to draw those humors down through the system and distribute them evenly in order to get rid of that um, headache or that fever. And so a way to do this was to make a draft with onions, slicing them, warming them in front of the fire, as, as warm as the child could bear on the soles of the feet, and then binding them onto the feet and the onions would act as a draft to draw down the humors from the head to remedy the fever or the headache. And we'll go to patient number one. Wasp sting. I'm a five-year-old child. While I was helping my mother in the kitchen garden, I was stung by a wasp. Well, you were really lucky because the remedy for the wasp sting probably was right there in the garden, and it's a raw onion slice. The sulfur in the raw onion, the, the um, component that gives it that strong aroma, uh, will neutralize the venom of the wasp. And so if you can apply right away a fresh slice of raw onion to the sting, it will take the sting out. And we'll go quickly to number five. Number five. I'm a blacksmith and I burn my hand at the forge. Oh, such a common accident. As um, Mrs. Child said, burns, accidents of this kind are so common that remedies ought to always be in the house. And to make the remedy, um, there are plants. Um, I brought along a, a bit of plantain, probably not, certainly not my husband's favorite plant in the lawn, uh, but maybe one that you are very familiar with, the lawnweed broadleafed plantain, um, which is a healing herb. It contains components that will heal wounds and close up wounds. And the house leek plant on the left, a plant that today is probably more commonly known as hens and chicks, uh, uh, the Semper Vivum. Uh, in the past, it was known as house leek. It will grow, I've seen it in Yorkshire and England, planted on the stone roofs of houses there where it will grow without much soil at all. And it was believed to ward off lightning strikes, so it's the same house leaf. Either of these plants by themselves, or even better, according to Mrs. Child, an ointment that you might make with um, both of these plants combined, an equal portion of plantain and house leek, breaking the leaves up, simmering them in new butter, a fat, uh, forming a cooling <coughs> ointment for inflamed surfaces and blisters. And keeping this ointment or salve on hand could be used to treat burns. So you might at the blacksmith shop want to keep a, a salve made of house leek and plantain. So we'll close up with an invitation um, for you to come and um, check out the herb garden at Old Sturbridge Village. Uh, in that collection, we grow between, uh, in, when it's in full, um, we're still bringing plants in. Not everybody is there for the summer, but probably about 70% of the collection is hardy perennial material. We have between three and 400 different varieties of plants documented in use in New England prior to 1840. And so you can get a closer, up close and personal look at some of these plants by stopping in and visiting our garden. And uh, happy to have questions if we have time for a question. One question because we really need to okay. close up, I'm sorry. Any really questions? good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. You're welcome.
I put some lists of some books on your um, handout and also a couple of websites that um, I used to rely on the library at Sturbridge Village for my primary source material because it has such a wonderful collection. But loads of those um, historic books have now been digitized by libraries and you can access them. And I put three um, websites that I use, um, archive.org, Hatha Trust, and Biodiversity Heritage Library. Uh, their websites have access to a wide variety of uh, digitized collections, so you can actually read these books online just as they look in their Use original. Culpepper's book? Um, oh, yes. Culpepper was reprinted here in Massachusetts in 1826, 200 years, uh, almost 200 years after he wrote it in the first place. So, yeah, so he was an old English, but he was still being followed in the 19th century.